Good to see some of you back for the second webinar in our series, um, your eDNA crash courses. Um, all right, let's jump into it. So for today, we really wanted to cover um, eDNA for bioassessment. Hopefully, um, for those of you that were able to join our eDNA 101 webinar, you'll feel comfortable with a number of the different terminology um, and technologies that we'll be talking about today. Um, specifically today, I wanted to cover um, fishery stock assessment and how we use DNA-based methods for better understanding fish populations. Um, and then also dive into some more direct um, bioassessment applications such as surveying for benthic macroinvertebrates and benthic algae. This is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about here in California um, and it's really close to my heart and what I spend my time doing um, and hopefully it gives you like a broad overview of all the different ways that we can be using these technologies to help accelerate the generation of high quality species data um, for biomonitoring and bioassessment. So at the end of today's presentation, what I'm hoping that you walk away with is that you are familiar with eDNA applications for fisheries and bioassessment applications, that you understand the limitations of each of these approaches I'll be talking about um, some of the limitations, strengths, and weaknesses of each of these different approaches and the ways that we're working to address them or overcome them. And then also, um, Lindsay will be taking over for the second half, and we'll be hearing about uh, the vision for the implementation of DNA-based methods into a variety of different SWAM programs. So looking forward to that as well. Okay, if you joined us for our eDNA 101 webinar, this figure would look familiar. And I like to use it to kind of highlight all of the different applications where we can be incorporating these DNA-based approaches, everything from looking at um, environmental change, species range shifts, invasive and endangered species. As I mentioned for today, we're really gonna be focusing on these two key elements, fishery stock assessments, and then impact assessment or bioassessment. Similarly, um, when we think about which of the technologies are most often used in these two different approaches, it's really primarily quantitative PCR or digital PCR for quantification of target taxa, and then DNA metabarcode sequencing that we're often using for identifying multiple taxa that are present in environment, doing biodiversity types of surveys. So for today, you'll primarily be hearing me talk about either quantitative measures using qPCR or digital PCR or targeted species approaches, or DNA MARTA barcode sequencing, which you may have heard referred to as high throughput sequencing, um, the ways that we're looking at like a whole snapshot of a community um, to get a sense of biodiversity and how that might be indicative of biological condition. So first off, let's dive into how folks are using eDNA for fisheries assessments. As I mentioned, there are primarily two different approaches. One that's very species specific or what we would call targeted species application. So this is where you're using things like quantitative PCR and digital PCR. And these methods are most often um, used for applications that are looking at introduction of invasive or non-native species, um, trying to discriminate cryptic species, so those that are really difficult to uh, identify based on morphology or really closely related using these targeted species specific approaches for that. Often biosecurity types of implications where you really want high sensitivity so that you can identify when an organism is introduced that you don't want there. And you wanna be able to know that it's there as soon as possible using these really hypersensitive approaches that you get with quantitative PCR and digital PCR. In terms of the community-based approaches that we're using for fisheries applications, that's everything that you might think of looking at fish biodiversity surveys, um, all the different species that might be present in your lake or in your coastal system, how that impacts different um, trophic networks, looking at feeding behaviors, um, being able to sequence organisms like ichthyoplankton that can be really difficult to discriminate with morphology alone. Um, and so being able to sequence those communities using DNA-based approaches, getting access to data that we didn't have access to previously using just morphotaxonomic or microscopy-based approaches alone. Um, also looking, of course, at aquaculture, um, how different indigenous species might get introduced through barrels or harbor water. Um, and again, just getting broad overview pictures of all the different organisms that might be present in the sample and the advantage of using a DNA metabarcoding approach is you can do that all at one time from a single sample. 
Okay, now I want to step through a couple of studies that I think do a really good job of kind of highlighting how we're taking those different DNA-based technologies and using them to address some critical research questions. So one of the best examples that I can think of, I think I mentioned it last time in our previous webinar as well, of where we're using quantitative PCR and digital PCR for quantifying target um, fish communities is in the NOAA Pacific Hake surveys. So with these surveys, um, traditionally we've been generating um, data using acoustic trawls where they're traveling up and down the west coast of the U.S. looking using acoustic trawling data to get a sense of the populations of these Pacific hake, which are a commercially relevant species. What they've now started doing is also collecting water eDNA samples at the same time that they're going out and doing those acoustic trawls. And then they're extracting the DNA from those samples and using a quantitative PCR approach that's specific for these Pacific, uh, Pacific hake taxa. And then comparing the uh, relative abundances that they're getting from the acoustic trawl data to these absolute abundances that they're getting um, or the absolute gene copy abundances that they're getting through the quantitative PCR approach. The figure that I'm showing you here on the left hand side of your screen is showing you how tight the relationship was between the abundance estimates that they were getting from their eDNA based data to their acoustic trawl data. So with this specific uh, species specific assay, they were able to get really nice confirmation of what they were finding in their acoustic trawl data using the eDNA based approach as well. One of the other advantages of using the eDNA based approach is it is species specific. So as opposed to the acoustic trawl data where you're not always sure you're picking up just these specific hate, we can be sure because we know it's such a specific assay um, that they were using for monitoring for these uh, Pacific hake species. When we think about how we might want to evaluate fish communities as a whole, moving now into some of these meta DNA metabarcoding approaches, um, this has become really popular, again, for better understanding biodiversity trends um, of fish populations. So I'm showing you an example here from Boardman Lake, which is in Michigan, um, and where they collected a number of different samples, or they had a number of different sampling regions all throughout the lake, and they were using four different approaches for assessing these fish communities. Two of them relied on traditional nets, a fight net and a gill net. And then they also did two different DNA metabarcode sequencing approaches targeting two different gene regions to see how well their uh, estimates of fish abundance were using all four of these different approaches. So the figure here that I'm showing you on the right hand side of your screen shows on the X axis the number of samples that they were collecting and then on the Y axis the approximate species richness that they were getting with each of these different approaches. We can see that with the eDNA based approaches in comparison to the traditional approaches, they were able to identify more fish taxa, get higher resolution of uh, who those different fish taxa were and um, overall uh, in comparison to these traditional net-based approaches, they were able to identify more fish taxa um, throughout all of their different sampling sites. That's going to be a theme throughout a couple of the different uh, studies that I'll be walking you through. So similarly, um, off the coast of New Jersey, there's been a long-going fisheries trawl study to look at a number, again, of different fish populations and see how they're varying both seasonally and interannually. And so this work that's been led by Mark Stokel um, out of Rockefeller has been for the past couple of years collecting an eDNA, water eDNA samples alongside those traditional trawl surveys. And so the figure that you see here in the center of your screen is showing you again the approximate species that they're detecting from each of these different pair trawling and eDNA, water eDNA samples. And on average, with each of these eDNA samples, they're collect, they're identifying more fish taxa um, during each of these different seasons than they were with the traditional trawl based approach. They've also been doing some really neat work with this study to link the abundances of these different organisms with the DNA metabarcoding approaches where they're able to quantify biomass of the target organisms and then uh, compare that to the percentage of reads that's identified or the DNA sequences of those target organisms from each of their different samples. So they've really been pushing the field forward in terms of saying not just the total number of species richness that I was able to identify using these DNA metabarcoding approaches, but also the relative abundances in my DNA sequence data. How well is that matching with the expected uh, biomass that I would expect from the taxa that we're identifying um, using those traditional trawl-based methods. They've gone even one step further recently where they're coupling DNA metabarcode sequencing and some of these quantitative-based uh, approaches to correct some of their DNA metabarcode reads to even tighten up that relationship even more, where we get some really nice um, correspondence between the ex 
relative abundance of DNA sequence reads from their DNA meta barcoding results, and then in comparison to the biomass of those fish, and therefore the amount of DNA um, from each of those individuals that's ending up in their water eDNA sample. Okay, the last couple of examples that I wanted to show you come from right here in our own backyard. Um, different eDNA-based approaches to fisheries assessments that have been happening here in Southern California um, through the Southern California um, Bite Regional Surveys. So one of them was focused specifically in the port of Los Angeles and the ports of Long Beach where water eDNA samples were collected alongside traditional trawl-based surveys. And so these figures here on the right hand side of your screen, you can see a number of the different sampling sites um, where they were collecting those water eDNA samples paired with the trawling samples. And again, they were using a DNA metabarcoding approach to quantify the number of fish species that they were able to identify with each of these different uh, approaches. And again, what we're seeing is that the DNA based approach was able to identify just about as many, um, with the exception of one species, and then a whole host more. Um, so additional taxa that were identified using these DNA based approaches um, in comparison to the traditional trawl based surveys. Similarly, as I mentioned before, ichthyoplankton taxa can be really difficult to discriminate um, using traditional microscopy. And so a study that was led by Davi Kasev, um, where they collected water eDNA, or they actually collected the trawling samples and they homogenized them and they sequenced them using DNA-based approaches. And this pie chart here shown on the top shows that previously, because these ichthyoplankton taxa are so difficult to identify, the majority of the species were unknown. We couldn't assign a species name to them. And then in contrast, when they used a DNA metabarcoding approach, they were able to begin to assign some, um, if not species, the genus or family level assignments to some of those taxa that were previously unidentified. So hopefully this paints a bit of a picture of the way that we might be using DNA metabarcode sequencing to better understand fisheries communities as a whole and look at biodiversity and see how many different taxa we can be picking up in comparison to some of the traditional methods and also the times that we want, want to instead be using a quantitative approach such as quantitative PCR, digital PCR, um, when we're really interested in doing targeted species specific surveys to get those quantitative estimates. Um, but I always want to caution that, you know, eDNA is not a silver bullet and that there are some real strengths and limitations. And so I like this table here because it's reminding us that using traditional surveys, you can still be getting some information that we haven't yet found out a way to get through DNA based approaches. So in particular, um, if we have questions about life stages or maturity of the fish or fertility status of various taxa to date, those are areas where, you know, they're active areas of research where we're trying to develop those molecular based tools to get us some of those answers, sometimes going down um, the metagenomics route or the metatranscriptomics route, um, but we're not there yet. And with traditional DNA metabarcoding um, or quantitative PCR, we're still mostly getting either quantitative estimates of individual taxa or relative abundance estimates of whole populations. So I think a number of these studies are showing us consistently that we can be generating this DNA sequence data faster, cheaper, and often less invasively and destructively, which is really a critical consideration, especially if we have some sensitive taxa. Um, the DNA surveys are often identifying more species than these traditional approaches, um, but that there's still work to be done to document age, uh, size, sex, and condition of these populations as well, um, and that those are all active areas of research um, that hopefully we'll see new developments coming online in future years that are enable us to get some of that additional information to help us um, better make better informed manage management decisions. Okay, sound good? I'm going to shift gears now um, and move on to bioassessment, as I said, for benthic macroinvertebrates and algae. I'll just take a quick pause. Um, I can't see the chat, but if there were any questions, um, I'd be happy to take them right now for fish. Otherwise, I'll keep going. Good, okay. Um, so talking about traditional bioassessment. So bioassessment, um, using biological communities to understand the ecological condition of an environment. Um, as I mentioned, one of my favorite places um, to be applying these DNA-based methods. Traditionally, we're going out into the field and we're collecting a sample and maybe it's benthic macroinvertebrates from marine or freshwater systems, or maybe it's benthic algae. Um, even it could be fish populations as well. 
We're collecting that sample. We're analyzing it using traditional microscopy for morphotaxonomic data. And then we might take those um, taxa lists that get generated from those microscopy um, efforts. And we take those taxa lists and we use them to calculate an index score. And that index score is telling us approximately the condition um, of those environments based on those biological communities. You'll oftentimes see it ranked either, you know, as a zero to 100 score, or you can get these different color codings that essentially tell you, um, are these communities impacted or not, or how stressed might they be? So this is a tool that's often used um, for assessing various um, environments. And now um, we've been exploring novel ways to apply, apply DNA-based approaches for generating that same taxonomy data, this time using DNA sequence-based approaches. Um, Across the board, most folks are turning towards DNA metabarcode sequencing approaches because, again, it allows us to survey the whole community of organisms that are present there, whether you're looking at benthic macroinvertebrates or benthic algae or fish or all of the above. You can even be including some of your prokaryotic communities, such as bacteria and multitrophic approaches, which, again, is a novel um, characteristic of using DNA-based approaches, giving us, again, access to information that we didn't have before. Um, so what it looks like when we're beginning to incorporate these DNA-based methods into bioassessment, we're still going out into the field. We're still often collecting our our samples in the way we traditionally were, um, using kick neck sampling or doing rock scrapes um, for benthic algae. And so you're going back to the wet lab processing your sample, but this time you're subjecting it to DNA extraction and then amplification using your different uh, primer sets that are specifically targeted to your organisms of interest. And then we'll do high throughput sequencing or DNA metabarcode sequencing to generate that DNA sequence data that then gets quality filtered, undergoes QA, QC, and then we assign um, species identifications or genus level identifications. So we perform our taxonomic assignment, and then that goes through our data analysis pipelines to calculate our biological index scores and perform our quality assessment. So in some ways, this pipeline going from the field to taxolists looks really similar. A lot of our field methods are the same, and we're ending up with tax taxolists like we would with our traditional microscopy-based approaches. Obviously, the key difference, though, is that we are using a DNA metabarcoding approach um, to generate that taxonomy data, and we're using bioinformatics to assign those species identifications to all of those raw sequences. So one of the primary motivations of exploring a DNA-based approach for bioassessment is that there's been a dwindling number of taxonomists available to do the complex, highly skilled morphotaxonomic analyses. And this has resulted in big backlogs and being able to get this data in a timely manner, and it's also resulted in increasing costs. So now a number of groups have been exploring how DNA metabarcode sequencing can serve as an alternative and complementary approach to the traditional microscopy-based taxonomy so that we can be generating those taxolists and calculating those biological indices and getting those inferences on biological condition in a more timely and cost-effective manner. So as I mentioned, there are um, two key groups where we've been applying these DNA-based approaches um, most frequently, and that is for looking at benthic macroinvertebrate communities as well as benthic algal communities. So if you haven't spent much time thinking about these organisms and their role in bioassessment, these two figures just give you kind of a rough overview. Often we're looking at different species that we know respond to various stressors, and if they're really sensitive taxa, then we expect to see their numbers dwindle as we get into greater, um, more stressed environments or more impacted conditions. Um, and if they're more resistant, super hardy taxa, then we expect to see them in greater abundances um, under those more impacted um, or stressed environments. So because of the great um, number of papers that have been published that allow us to better understand the autoecological um, traits of these various taxa, so how they respond in their environment, what they might be sensitive to, and what we can use them as a bioindicator for, we've been able to harness all of this ecological information and develop a number of these biological indices that are often relying on these trait attributes um, that we have through um, published literature for all of these different taxonomic groups. So when it comes to tra transitioning some of these traditional biological indices to be able to be used with DNA metabarcoding data, it often looks something like this. We have our traditional 
benthic macroinvertebrate sample, for example, that gets collected and preserved in ethanol. And those samples often are sitting in jars until they're able to be sorted and identified by a trained taxonomist. Now, instead, we're blenderizing them. So we're often just homogenizing the whole sample, and then we're extracting the DNA from that and performing DNA metabarcode sequencing or high throughput sequencing. Um, and then we're using these global reference databases to assign the taxonomic identity to all those raw sequences that we've generated out of our homogenized sample. Then we will often use that and feed it into the calculators that we've generated for these various biological indices. So I'm showing you an example here from a paper that was specifically looking at benthic macroinvertebrates in Finnish streams, and they have an index called the ecological quality ratios that they calculate. Um, and you can see on the x-axis, we had the um, biological index score that was calculated using morphology-based data, so the traditional approach. And then on the y-axis, we have the taxonomy data that was generated using the DNA-based data. You can see that there's a pretty nice relationship between the two of them. It's not exactly one-to-one, -one, but we get pretty close, um, although not perfect. One of the key things that we look for, though, is if you're classifying sites in the same class. So are they all sitting kind of within that same um, colored box so that even if there's a little bit of variability in the relative abundance of taxon um, or who was it, identified or some of the biodiversity estimates, if there's a little bit of variability, are you still resulting in the same assessment score, um, which we use really as our metric of success that we're getting the same data output as we would expect with traditional uh, microscopy based approaches. Another example of using DNA based sequencing for assessing benthic macroinvertebrate communities comes out of Canada. Um, they pioneered some of the work. This was a paper that came out uh, back in 2015 where they had a series of riverine wetland samples that were collected and they analyzed the benthic macroinvertebrate communities. You can see again um, on the left hand side of your screen that using the DNA based approach, they were able to identify greater um, species richness across all of their samples than in comparison to the traditional, what's said here is called CABIN, um, which stands for their Canadian Aquatic Biomonitoring Network. So based on their traditional morphotaxonomic analyses where they didn't get quite the same diversity that they did for their DNA-based approaches. And the figures here on the right-hand side of your screen are showing the differences in community composition from two of the key locations. And we can see when they're using traditional morphotaxonomic approaches, there's really kind of a big overlap um, in the biodiversity identified across all these different samples from these two different regions. But when we start to use DNA sequence-based approaches, we see nice distinct clustering of these two different sites um, and their different species um, taxonomic composition. So the DNA was just also helping able to resolve some of these differences between sites in addition to identifying a greater number of species richness overall. Okay, so similarly for algal bioassessment, um, we've been taking some of these traditional indices that have been used sometimes for decades and have been, you know, routinely tested and are implemented in a number of broad scale monitoring programs to support the water framework directive over in um, Europe, and now they're wanting to ad uh, advance the incorporation of DNA-based approaches for generating some of that taxonomy data. This is an example of some of the work that was done throughout a program called DNA Aquanet, which is a really great initiative um, that lasted five years over in Europe, where it brought together a number of the European Union countries to help um, develop DNA sequence-based approaches for bioassessment, both for benthic macroinvertebrate communities and algal communities. And so this is an example of a study that was performed um, for benthic algae samples that were collected in a series of French streams. So we have a similar approach here where you're doing your traditional biofilm sampling. Normally, you're taking it into the lab, processing that sample, and then doing microscopy-based analyses to come up with your taxa lists, and then using those taxa lists and the trait attributes that are associated with all those different taxa and calculating your biological index scores going from pretty bad to very good. Um, and this time instead, also developing an approach where you're taking that same biofilm sampling and extracting total DNA, doing DNA metabarcode sequencing, and then again, calculating those biological index scores. One of the really neat things that they've been doing um, for this specific application, which was focused on diatom communities in particular, was they were actually taking the DNA sequence data and correcting it based on the biovolume of individual taxa. And the reason that they had to do that was we know that when you have some larger diatom taxa, it actually has greater number of copies of the genes that we're targeting. 
for uh, DNA metabarcode sequencing and species identification. So if you have a greater number of the copies of that gene in a given individual, its relative abundance numbers will be overinflated into comparison to some smaller individuals who have fewer copies of those genes. So this figure on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see again that plot where we're comparing the biological index scores that get calculated using the morphology or the traditional data on your x-axis, on your y-axis, we're calculating that score using DNA-based data. And the figure on the top was those raw numbers, and the figure on the bottom was when they corrected some of those numbers using um, the corrections based on the biovolume of these individual diatoms. So there's just been some really neat ways that we're trying to improve the performance of these biological indices using these DNA-based data going so far as to take into account the biovolume of individual taxa, and then using that to correct some of the relative abundances for these different taxa in the sample in the hopes of getting greater alignment between the traditional microscopy-based index scores and those DNA-based index scores. So this has been really neat work to follow along with, um, and there have been a number of different ways that they've been piloting here the biovolume correction, also development of new DNA barcode primer sets, also development of new bioinformatic pipelines, all to get enhanced performance of those biological index scores when they're calculated with this DNA-based data. Um, so they've been inspiring a lot of the work that we've been doing here in California as well. So in California, we have a biological index for benthic algae that we published back in 2020, and it uses both diatom communities and then what we call soft algae communities, um, which includes cyanobacteria as well as eukaryotic um, soft-bodied algae. And so we use a similar approach here in California as we've been piloting um, the exploration of a DNA metabarcoding approach um, for generating these index scores where we take the um, sample that gets collected in the field and it gets split in two. And one part gets filtered down onto a filter and then extracted for DNA metabarcode sequencing. And the other part gets processed for traditional microscopy. And then we generate our taxa list and then we calculate our biological index scores. And when we started this work, because we have the added complexity of looking at multiple different algal taxa to generate these biological index scores, one of our first questions was which DNA barcode primer set we should be using for generate the, generating these taxa lists. And we knew that the selection of this primer set could have really big impact on our downstream taxa lists and therefore the downstream index scores that we end up calculating. So we explored a couple of different DNA barcode primer sets, some that were universal for all bacteria, because we knew we wanted to be able to sequence the cyanobacterial communities, some that were universal for all um, eukaryotic communities, again, to pick up on some of those eukaryotic algae, and then a primer set that was specific just for diatom taxa, um, so that we could get really uh, good estimates specifically for those communities as well. This figure that I'm showing you here just shows you all the different permutations of combining those different DNA primer sets to generate this DNA metabarcode data to get really good snapshot of all the different taxa, algae taxa that were present in our sample. And I've ordered them here from increasing number of species that were identified using all of these different primer sets. And what we were finding was the more primer sets that we were using, the more sequencing we were doing, the more species we were identifying, and the closer we were getting to the number of taxa that were identified using those morphotaxonomic or the traditional microscopy-based approach. So it really was more DNA barcode primer sets, more taxa we were able to identify. So similarly for our California stream samples, we wanted to compare the biological index scores that get calculated with morphology um, to the biological index scores that get calculated with DNA-based data. And we saw by and large a pretty good relationship between index scores using that traditional microscopy versus the DNA-based approaches. So they were pretty good, but not great. And so we wanna get them um, even better if we can. And we wanted to dive into exactly why we would see some differences in our samples um, when we're comparing the taxa lists that get generated with microscopy to those that get generated with um, the DNA metabarcoding approaches. And so this Venn diagram that I hear, have here on the right-hand side of your screen was the number of species that was identified for each of these different DNA barcode primer sets in comparison to the microscopy data. And what we were finding that was, as this example shows you for diatoms in particular, there were a number of taxa that were showing up in our microscopy data that we weren't finding in our DNA sequence data. And we attributed a lot of that to the gaps in those DNA reference libraries. So as we talked about um, in the eDNA 101 session, your ability to assign these species names to your raw DNA sequence data really hinges on having a 
complete DNA reference library. So these global repositories that allow you to say what taxa I have present in my sample. And if we're missing some key taxa in California, the estimates are between 30 and 40 percent of our stream algae taxa are currently missing some of those reference sequences. It means that we won't be able to assign those species name to our raw sequence data. And that ends up um, resulting in some of these mismatches between the scores that get calculated with microscopy data and the scores that get um, calculated with DNA based data. So this is not only a California problem, this is really a global phenomenon. Um, we know that there are just a lot of gaps in these DNA reference libraries. Um, and it's something that there are a number of teams across the US and beyond that are working to fill in those gaps and identify those organisms, grow them up in culture or have voucher specimens, sequence them. Um, and begin to fill in those gaps in those DNA reference libraries. One of the other approaches, though, to overcoming some of these DNA reference library um, limitations is generating new biological indices that rely only on DNA-based data. And so we refer to these as taxonomy-free biological indices because you're not having to link your DNA sequence data to a taxonomy name anymore. And the way that we do that is we take your traditional sample that you've collected out in the field Normally, as we've talked about before, you would take it into the lab, we'd look at it under a microscope, you'd count your species, um, you would assign some of these trait attributes, um, again, declaring if a species is sensitive or tolerant, and you would use those trait attributes to develop biological indices. With these taxonomy free approaches, instead, we're now taking sequence reads or DNA sequence data here, it's referring it to OTUs or operational taxonomic units It's just how we refer to some of this like raw sequence data. And we're looking at how these raw sequences might vary across different stressor gradients or across different environmental condition or eco regional differences. And we're now taking the distribution of these sequences um, and assigning trait attributes to that sequence data instead. So now instead of assigning it to an individual that we've identified under a microscope, we're assigning these trait attributes to DNA sequence data. Um, and we're using those trait attributes um, to develop these biological indices. So this is something there are a number of groups working on right now. Um, in particular, the EPA has been applying this approach for diatom communities. So this figure here on the left hand side of your screen shows a study where they were identifying various DNA sequences, again, using the nomenclature OTUs or operational taxonomic units um, to identify which taxa um, were responding across which different stressor gradients or here, which sequences were responding across which stressor gradients. Um, which we're inferring our individual species. And so this was an example using total nitrogen where they were looking at who were the really sensitive responders to nitrogen, who were really hardy and could withstand really high um, nitrogen concentrations. And then we would assign that trait attribute to these various sequence identities and use that to develop a new index. We can also use the distribution of these various DNA sequences to develop a different type of index that doesn't rely on trait attributes, but actually relies on the presence or absence of these different individuals or an observed versus expected O over E index that is um, typically been used in a number of different benthic macro invertebrate surveys. Um, and so there was a study that came out a couple years ago that used this observed versus expected approach for diatom communities, where again, they were taking DNA sequence data and developing some predictive models to say under given conditions, I would expect to see some of these DNA sequences at certain sites versus others. Um, and in the absence of that expected organism, you would develop um, a rating scale to downgrade a site if it was missing some of these expected taxa and essentially evaluate um, a site based on which DNA sequences you identified there as an analog for which species would be present um, and use that as a way to evaluate the biological condition of your site based on those observed versus expected um, taxa in the form of raw DNA sequences. As I mentioned, um, this has been inspiring a lot of the work that we're doing here in California as well, where we're now developing these taxonomy free as well as more traditional taxonomy dependent types of approaches, all using DNA data um, instead in place of morphotaxonomic or microscopy based data. And so right now we're actively developing these novel or DNA based indices. I show a couple of preliminary figures that we he have here where we've been looking at um, these diatom communities at reference and impacted sites. We've been exploring both um, a multimetric or more traditional based biological index as well as this O over E approach using again, both a taxonomy free version and then one that I would say is linked to taxonomic assignment. And um, 
right now we're seeing that DNA sequencing has the potential to be 10% um, as costly as the microscopy based analyses for these samples. So that's been one of the biggest motivators for generating DNA based data for our algal bioassessment is really the cost savings that we have the potential to um, gain if we move towards a DNA based approach. With that, though, I would like to, of course, highlight some of the key limitations of using these approaches. As I mentioned before, we're often running into limitations in DNA reference library completeness, um, and that can really hamper the number of taxa that we can confidently assign species names to, and that will really limit the performance of these biological indices. So as this figure here on the left-hand side of your screen shows you, gaps in these DNA reference libraries means that you're going to potentially be overlooking some taxa um, and that you will just not be able to have the same level of performance of those biological indices that you would um, with a complete DNA reference library. Um, similarly, right now in the field, there has been a lot of work to try and unify researchers on a number of different sampling and analytical protocols, but there's one, uh, there's not been one universal protocol for sampling and analysis yet um, that has been identified. So that's something that we try and do at the California Molecular Methods Work Group is generate the standardized protocols for collecting and analyzing your samples so that we can be ensuring comparable high quality data is getting used um, no matter who's collecting it or who's analyzing it. If they're using these protocols, we know that they've met certain QA and QC criteria. Um, so that is also an active area of research that we've been working really closely with Lindsay and Swamp and Oima on developing these protocols. Um, and it's a really big priority for us to come up with these standardized protocols so that we can be unifying the community around uh, the best practices for collecting and analyzing these samples. Okay, um, that is it for me right now. And I'm gonna hand it over to Lindsay, who's gonna be telling you more about SWAMP's vision for the implementation of these DNA-based methods. And then I think we'll take questions all at the end. That sounds good. Uh, thanks so much for that um, that brilliant introduction to all of this information around uh, bioassessment. So that really leads well into what I'm gonna share with you guys today. So hello everyone, my name is Lindsay Metz um, and I, am the uh, bacteria data manager with the Swamp IQ unit at um, the uh, State Water Board. And I am going to be talking to you today about one of our projects that we have that I am leading, which is the Swamp eDNA Metabarcoding Monitoring and Analysis Project, or CMAP. And so let's just get into it. Sorry. There we go. All right, so just to give you an overview of what this project is. So this project was formed just a couple of years ago um, as an idea that was had by a member of our unit um, to explore how we could potentially use eDNA data um, in our bioassessment pro uh, pro program, sorry, in the SWAMP unit. Um, and so we formed the CMAP project then, and we just this past year had our first official year of sampling, which is super exciting. So we're just now getting to go through some of that initial data that we have. Um, but this project is an, aqu an aquatic eDNA monitoring project that is um, associated with the Swamp Bioassessment pro Program, and that is facilitated by the Swamp pro uh, Program with the State Water Board. So what this project aims to do is to collect eDNA data across the state of California. Uh, we currently focus on three major taxonomic groups, which were just highlighted by Susie. So we're looking at fish um, using the MyFish uh, primer set, phytoplankton using 23S primers and benthic macroinvertebrates using the ARTH-COI primer set. And we are also facilitating this project by working with partner, organ partner organizations um, across the state, which allows us both simultaneously to increase the scope of our sampling, both spatially and temporally, which has always traditionally been a limitation for us. Um, obviously, the more sites you add and the more, uh, you know, different times that you're visiting those sites, the, the more co costly these efforts become. Um, so working with these partners allows us to increase the scope of our project, and it also gives us uh, gives access to new data to our partner organizations that we work with. So we're really focusing on trying to get biological data into the hands of our partner organizations, um, and that's a big part of this project. So the two main goals that we have with the SWAT, with the CMAP project, 
Um, the first big main goal that we have is to explore the use of eDNA in bioassessment at the water board. So what could that possibly look like both um, in the context of what we're able to accomplish now and into the future? So how could we potentially use eDNA to change the way that we conduct bioassessment? Um, and we're really working closely with Susie and the uh, work that they're doing at Squirp um, with building these um, these molecular-based ASCII indice scores that she was talking about earlier, um, seeing how that could potentially change the way that we um, conduct bioassessment in the future. And also looking at how with CMAP, the samples that we're taking are all surface water samples. This is a little bit different than some of the ways that we collect um, traditional taxonomy samples. Um, uh, Susie had mentioned KICNET samples for BMI or, you know, scraping benthic algae off of rocks. How does, um, how does what we can collect just from taking surface water samples compare to those other sampling methods? And do we see the same types of taxa um, because the surface samples are a lot easier to collect. And so that makes it a bit more accessible for different groups to be able to go out and collect these samples. Um, and then what new types of information can we possibly get from eDNA? Um, so traditionally, we collect biological samples to, um, to see how different sites perform in these different uh, biological indices, but there's also value in collecting this data just in being able to look more at the biodiversity at these sites and being able to gather that information um, as we move you know into the future where we're likely going to be losing biota at different locations due to climate change and other abiotic factors so how can we use that um, that biodiversity data and then what can edna say about the health and the quality of the watersheds that we're actually surveying because we want to ensure that that's an important focus of what we're doing in our water quality monitoring work is actually looking at the quality of these watersheds um, which relates a lot back to the biodiversity that we're seeing um, and then the other major goal that we have is to make biological data more available and accessible to different groups. So this is a collaborative science-based project. Uh, we're working with uh, partners from various other state agencies, community organizations, as well as uh, tribal governments, and getting them uh, access to the DNA tech, uh, sequencing technology so that they can also look at the biodiversity in their watersheds. And um, we're testing currently the use of these inexpensive eDNA collection kits for this, this uh, project to see how well they perform and if this could potentially be a workable model going into the future using these inexpensive kits. Um, and getting these into the hands of our partners. And then also really working to help our partner organizations um, design studies and ask questions about their watersheds that are meaningful and that get them new information that's novel that they previously didn't have access to. So I just wanted to highlight really quickly our partner organizations. Um, we have several partners that worked with us last year. We have a lot of tribal governments that were working with us as well as community organizations. We had um, several of the swamp or of the uh, regional water boards, their swamp programs working with us last year. Um, and that's really what allowed this project to, to happen and what allowed us to have access to data from um, so many different areas around the state that previously we, we weren't um, able to collect data at. And so really working with these partners, making this a community-based project has been a really, um, really interesting and exciting way to approach this project uh, to get people involved and to um, give us access to, to more parts of the state that we can get biological data from. And then just to go into these kits that we're using, these, these new um, eDNA collection kits. So there's a company called Jonah Ventures that has put together these um, eDNA sequence kits that are really just a one-stop shop type of model. So you get the kit, the analysis and the bioinformatics are included in the, the cost of the kit. Um, there are multiple different types of um, analyses you can get, um, as well as different types of taxonomic groups that you can look at. They support PCR, metabarcoding, um, microbial source tracking based projects, um, and you can have one to three different analyses uh, performed on each kit. So these kits really make the process of collecting eDNA data really intuitive and simple, which is great for these kind of community-based um, scientific approaches. So 
the I have a picture on the left here that shows the components of the kit. It's it's just a syringe filter, a 60 milliliter disposable syringe, um, and some ethanol that is used to dry out the filters so that they can be preserved and then sent to the lab for analysis. And so what's really um, cool about these kits is that they require minimal technical training to use and they really make the eDNA technology accessible. So we're, we're seeing how well these compare to other samples that have been collected using different um, DNA uh, uh, sequencing approaches to see how well they perform and if this could be a sustainable model going forward in the future. So we just, as I highlighted at the beginning, we just finished our 2022 sampling season, um, which is super exciting. I've been going through that data, uh, pulling out some of the um, interesting biodiversity, spatial and temporal trends. Um, and I'm hoping to shortly compare um, some of the data that we've collected last season to data that we collect in our traditional um, bioassessment surveys that we do. Um, and then going forward this this next year, maybe potentially comparing some of our algal samples so, to some of the benthic uh, samples that Susie's been looking at with her uh, indexing work. But we were able to collect 174 different samples at 100 different sites around the state. Um, and we were able to do this over a sampling period of 10 months between March and December, which is uh, really exciting because that's a much bigger scope than we've ever been able to have before with, with sampling. Um, and we've so far identified 72 unique species of fish, 100 uh, uh, phytoplankton families, and 188 benthic macroinvertebrate families just with the pre preliminary analysis I've been doing, um, which is really exciting that we've been able to, to pull out some uh, quite a bit of diversity from these, these kits that we've been using. So. Um, and so what do we do with all this data that we get? We've put together this indicator panel, which is an online uh, data visualization resource um, that I have linked here in this slide deck uh, if anybody wants to go check it out later. Um, but this uh, is our uh, the first iteration that we have of this. I'm working on um, adding some new features to this to make the data um, a little bit more intuitive spatially and across um, over time. But we really want to make this data accessible publicly so that if people are interested about what types of species are appearing in different um, areas around the state, they're able to access this resource and um, navigate uh, the different sites that have been sampled through our map and figure out what has been identified in those locations. Um, I'm hoping to also add some uh, some more bio, uh, biodiversity type data to this uh, to this resource, but um, a big part of what we're doing is to make sure that all of this information is open to the public and um, can also potentially help anyone else who's trying to um, gather biological data um, from various uh, different areas around the state of California. So where do we go from here? Um, so we have, I have some some plans and some things that we want to continue to ask and pursue as we go forward for after this first year of this project. Um, we really want to look at comparing the traditional taxonomic data that we've gathered in the past to what we're seeing in these eDNA samples that we collect to understand, you know, how how well these are performing and how well they compare to to the biodiversity data that we would have captured previously. Um, we. I'm hoping to to really determine how much of the algal community we can um, capture from surface water samples. How much how much much of a representation do we get from um, from benthic samples or from benthic algae in these samples um, compared to just what we would find on the surface? And if that's this is a, a workable model for looking at um, those algal communities. Um, we're looking into other taxonomic groups that we could potentially explore in the future based on interest from our partners, which include uh, bacteria, um, amphibians, and then HABs and invasive species, which weren't talked about in this presentation, but will be talked about in future presentations, but are of great interest to a lot of people um, that we work with. Um, we're ho I'm currently working on analyzing data from last year for biodiversity related trends, which is something we want to continue to pull out of this data going forward because um, that's uh, novel data to us at the water boards that we haven't been previously collecting. 
um, and also determine what other questions that we're not currently asking that might potentially be answered with eDNA data, um, especially as the technology advances and um, we start to understand more of the the um, limitations in terms of DNA efficacy in the water column and things like that. Um, and so that's sort of where we're planning to go from here, but I I was just really excited to share how things have been going with this project so far as sort of an example of how this type of technology could be implemented um, in the regulatory space, um, how we're exploring the use of this technology, and um, how we're hoping to continue to implement it going forward into the future. And with that, I hope we still have some time for questions, Susie. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, I think we have like five minutes for questions. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I've been trying to tackle some in the chat also. Um, great. Thanks, Lindsay. That was such a nice overview. Okay, questions for Lindsay or me. Happy to answer them. You can send your questions in via the chat or you can unmute and ask your questions directly. Uh, thank you for the questions that are already in the queue. Uh, five of them have been submitted, and I know Susie's answered a couple of those already. Yes, um, I can get to Cajun's question that I think I haven't responded to just yet. So um, Cajun says here, participated in studies in Washington and Oregon and headwaters for various fish, and I was notified by the researcher that eDNA wasn't in good condition, high enough quality or enough present in sample collected. Do you see that for aquatic insects? This is a great question, Cajun, and definitely something that you might run into if um, there's fairly low biomass in your sample, if um, a sample has been inadequately preserved um, or it was sitting around for a little too long before it was extracted. Um, and it's something that we will definitely encounter more often, I would say in the water eDNA samples than typically with some of our more um, bulk sampling. So when we're, when we're extracting from sediments or like the benthic macroinvertebrate samples or the benthic algae samples, we tend to get a ton of really good high quality um, biomass and therefore DNA quantity yield has never really been a concern. Uh, we get pretty good yield. So it's something that you might run into if just kind of low volumes or low biomass in the sample itself, or if they're, um, the shedding since the organism was present was an extended period of time or the sample was sitting around for a long time. Lindsay, feel free to, if I left anything out. Um, Fraser has his hand up. Uh, Susie, Fraser has oh, his hand up. Hey, Fraser, go for it. Hi, hi, thank you. Yeah, thanks for answering the question in the, in the chat. I just wanted a clarification. Right at the end, you say some groups have circumvented the need for abundance and replaced it with a presence absence index. Yeah. That, that was really my point is that the presence absence index is not a good replacement for abundance um, because a lot of our ecological <laughs> concerns are related directly to abundance. So yeah, so I would in that in that like the quantitative estimates using PCR. Thanks. Yeah, so Fraser, I think you raise such a good point, especially when we have a pre-existing index that was tied to the relative abundance of various taxa and that that relative abundance is being used as a measure of condition um, and it's getting incorporated into the index itself. If from the very beginning, the index is designed to just be presence absence data, that's fine. Um, and you can still have a really high performing index like our California algal index, which is just presence absence data. Um, and we design the index that way in anticipation of one day hoping to calculate index scores with DNA based data. And we knew that relative abundances was gonna be a challenge. Um, I can't remember if I sent the link. I will if you um, are interested. One of the best examples that I can think of off the top of my head, I could dig around for a couple other ones where someone is using DNA metabarcode sequencing linked with an internal positive control to get closer to uh, relative accurate relative abundance estimates. Um, we're seeing it out of the French group where they've do, been doing those bio volume corrections to get better relative abundance estimates. And then from that, trawl data off of New Jersey that I was talking about where they're incorporating it to try and get closer to absolute biomass estimates. Um, there's some other really great examples of fish in streams where we're using um, various corrections of biomass, biovolume, fish size to get closer to absolute abundance estimates. Um, so there's a lot of active work and then, um, and then some of us who tried to go the presence absence route from the very beginning because relative abundances can be real tricky with eukaryotic organisms. 
I hope that answered your question. Um, any other questions? We're one minute over, but we could probably sneak in one last question. That'd be fine. OK, good. Um, thank you, Eric, um, for both posting our eDNA 101 seminar online so quickly. I already have been contacted by a bunch of folks who have been using that as a resource. So this one, likewise, will be posted online um, quickly. OK, great, Jill. Let's see if I can find your question. I can um, read it for you. Oh, there we how are. Do you handle, yeah. How do you handle the flow of DNA downstream? I, how can you assess BMIs at multiple sites on the same stream? Do sessile organisms leak DNA or not? Yes, good. I did type a response to this one, which I'll summarize in 20 seconds. Um, we definitely know that benthic organisms will shed DNA. Um, there's a lot of active research trying to get better handle on some of those shedding rates. We know that if you're an organism that's molting or you're in a reproductive stage, you might shed more of that material. Um, and so the downstream transport of eDNA is something that we worry a lot about um, and we think a lot about and we try and model and we try and put some parameters on um, the expectations of how far downstream eDNA might transit. Um, especially if we're collecting a water eDNA sample. When we're looking at some of those targeted bulk samples from benthic communities, any allochthonous, so outside of our sampling area, eDNA that gets introduced is making up a super small percentage of our total eDNA pool. We're really concentrating on that bulk community that we sample from our benthic um, organisms. And so the vast majority of DNA that we're going to sequence is coming from those organisms we sampled themselves. But that isn't to say that they don't shed and that there isn't downstream transport. There is, but when you're targeting those benthic communities, it's much, it's a teeny tiny fraction of the bulk DNA. Hope that answered your question. And we will post the link. Um, you can Google the California Water Quality Monitoring Council's Collaboration Network, and Eric has been dutifully posting the links to the recordings and the slides there, so they'll be up there soon. Um, thank yes, you, everyone, well. for your time. I hope this was a good crash course on eDNA and bioassessment. Um, and thanks to Lindsay, that was such a great overview of CMAP. And um, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar, which will be on eDNA for harmful algae. So um, thanks, everyone. See thank you next you, time. Susie. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all Thanks. so much. Bye.